Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm Vidya from Fresh Team, the HR software from Freshworks. Freshworks, as you may know, is a software as a service unicorn, which has over 300,000 businesses using its suite of products. And at Fresh Team, we curate stories of people and organizations that have gotten their growth strategies right. We also interview uh, thought leaders in the HR space to inspire and influence us. And today's very, very special guest, Professor Dave Aldrich, uh, who needs no introduction. He's widely recognized as the father of modern HR. And I could go on about it, but I think that will be a separate book altogether. So I'll hand it over to you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, Vidya, thank you. And Santil, thank you. Uh, let me invite you into my office. Uh, I'm obviously very casual. I got up this morning and did some exercise and, uh, and obviously have messy hair and unshaven, but that's what it means to be an entrepreneur. So welcome into my office with pictures of family and uh, icons of people whom I admire. And I hope today we can have an incredibly useful conversation that yes. will be helpful to you. So thank you for the privilege of being with, uh, letting me join you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're really delighted and honored to have you uh, today. And uh, today's theme is playbook for building the right HR team when you're growing from 50 to 500. So largely our questions will revolve around this theme. But since we have uh, Professor Aldrich himself with us, we would also like to take this opportunity to ask a few questions on other broad topics. So first we'll start with the theme. So for a company that has fairly found its footing, has about 50 employees and has received a fair share of growth funding and it is looking to uh, increase its headcount um, in the next few years, what according to you, uh, Dave, are its top three challenges? The first thought is the head of HR for a company with 50 people is probably the founder. And there is no more important thing than a founder can do to bring in the people who represent her or his values to create a culture or an identity of how we work with each other. Because when that's established from the beginning, that culture and those people go forward. Until a company probably gets 75 to 100 people, you may not need a formal HR person because the founder and those who work with him or her become the HR people. So three hints, as a founder uh, of a company, 50 growing to 500 and hopefully becoming like Vidya, your company, a unicorn, uh, which is an idea. Number one, think carefully about the culture you want to create. Culture is not an internal set of values that you believe in. It's an external identity. What does my firm want to be known for in the marketplace with our key customers today and tomorrow? that external brand identity or reputation should translate into the culture you're trying to create. Because when you can create an external brand that becomes your internal culture, that shapes your reputation and lets you grow. Two, pay an enormous amount of attention to the people you bring in. With a firm of 10,000 or 100,000 employees and you make a mistake in bringing somebody in, you can live with it. But when you have 50 people, each person you bring in is 2% of the company. Be very careful, be very thoughtful to look at their skills and technical ability, but even more, their ability to learn, to grow, to expand, and their values. Do their values of themselves represent the identity you wanna be known for in the marketplace? I'm gonna leave it with those two. Shape the culture and manage the people. Okay. Uh, could you also give us some examples of companies that you may have worked with, the kind of common mistakes they make, and uh, you know, uh, how a, you know, a founder can avoid those? I end up spending most of my time with larger companies, but uh, I've worked with a couple of smaller companies where friends and those I've worked with have joined on the, on the people. There's a technical problem. We've got to build this technology and chemistry or digital or whatever the business we're in. And we go find somebody who has a technical skill and we hire the person with that technical skill. We don't think about his or her cultural and social skill set. And so after they've been hired for three or four months and they've solved the technical problem, 
lo and behold, they may not be the cultural fit that we want to be known for in the marketplace, or they may not be very good at learning. They solve today's problem. They can't predict and learn tomorrow's problem. And so companies hire the first person that comes along technically. Culture. One of the things that sometimes is a mistake is I uh, worked with a small company and the culture was trying to be the founder's values. Here's the values I have. Here's what I believe in. And he was building the company based on his values. That sounds so terrific. But ultimately, the culture should reflect our customer promises. And so when I went into him, he said, I value A, B, and C. And I said, so what is it you promise your customers as a company? What's the identity you want to be known for? Well, it's C, D, and E. And I said, C, D, and E should shape your, va your, your culture, not A, B, and C. The third challenge I see with, uh, often with founders trying to grow, and it's one of the critical challenges of any company growing, is learn how to manage succession. Often founders become the, the embodiment. The whole company is woven around the founder and whatever he or she did. Ultimately, the founder needs to step aside. And the next generation of leaders needs to be picked, not because of who they are, but because of what they know that will help the business grow. If a founder replaces him or herself with somebody like them, they've not helped the company. They need to replace him or herself with somebody who will serve tomorrow's customers. And that idea of founder succession is where a lot of companies get in trouble because the founder has such a long shadow. I was in one company and it was a larger company. The CEO left and demanded that he stay on the board of directors to provide oversight because his shadow, he wanted oversight. He put in a great new CEO and the CEO he put in had the future, the understanding, but within about six months, the previous founder CEO on the board kept imposing his will and the, and the new CEO ended up leaving. What a tragedy. Founders at times need to let their next generation move on. And that becomes such a key factor. I don't know if uh, you have children, either of you, you're young, I'm obviously old. One of the things we learn as a parent is to pass on our beliefs to our children and then let them govern themselves. That our success is not what we do, but how our children learn to manage themselves. Um, we've had to learn that. We have three children, and I'm trying to look for pictures of our children sitting in my office. I should have more of them. But our children, ah, ah there's our family. Oh. Um, and our chi I can only do this when I'm in my office. So. Our children each have their way of living. And my job as a parent is to let them live their way, to let them become who they need to become. Um, and sometimes that's very hard. We have helicopter parents who want to control their children. That's not healthy for the parent or for the child. Founders need to let go. They need to let the next generation of leaders and leadership create the organization they need. That's so beautifully put, uh, Dave. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, the way you put it across uh, in terms of uh, why the founder's shadow should not be so long uh, and how company grows only when uh, the next set of people are able to execute for tomorrow's problem, right? I think that's 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 very very important, and uh, you see a lot of these companies, hungry companies who are hungry to go fast and grow fast, right? Uh, there are so many tech IPOs which happened recently of companies uh, which are which are like eight nine years old, right? Uh, so how do you see this? manifesting uh do you see some companies who have done this right and if so you you deal with quite a few large companies right who have gone through this uh, rapid growth phase uh do you do you uh, how the how does this manifest into those companies which have uh, probably like managed this part right and uh, managed to an extent that they are able to take it to ipo and so on and beyond you know, it's a tricky question and there's not one recipe. I wish there were six steps to making this happen. If, if somebody comes to you as a reader, as a listener to this video and says, 
I have the six steps that will guarantee your success. Do not <laughs> listen to them because there are no six steps. I've tried six steps of dieting and it's not working. Um, you've got to figure out what works for you. But there are some basic principles. Uh, one is grow fast, but two is grow smart. Um, I'm working with a company right now and uh, to grow fast, they borrowed a lot of money. They became very indebted to three major indebted uh, partners. Here's the problem. Those three partners about six months ago each happened to call in their loans. And so this company that had a high growth spurt on debt was not smart because when they called in their loans, they had to stop some of their innovation. Use good judgment. Grow fast, but grow smart. Um, and be thoughtful. Second principle, constantly think about outside in. Often when we grow fast, we think about who we are. I have a great idea. You should love it. We need to think about the value that that idea gives to a set of customers. Who are those customers? What does our idea do to benefit them? I've worked in some companies where the founder had a great idea and he or she took that idea and ran with it and they didn't think through carefully, what's the benefit of my idea to someone else? And so to constantly do that principle of outside in, value is always defined by the receiver. Who's gonna receive my product? How will it be beneficial to them? And how will my service build with them? And in theory, we grow as a firm when our customers get benefits and grow as well. So we wanna grow with our customers. Number three, be technically good at something. I have a friend who's a professor in IT technology at a university. And he said almost every semester, some very smart young student, boy, young man or young woman walks in and says, professor, I have an app that will save the world and transform everything that we do. Can you help me make it successful? And here's what my friend, the professor says to them. I encourage you to take a class in coding. How do you code? How do you do the basics? And the student, oh, I don't want to know how to code. I just want to make an app and become a, a, a unicorn. I want to be so successful because of my wisdom. And he says, unless and until you know the basics, you're not going to be successful. So as a founder, you are a founder because you know something. But make sure that what you know is grounded and adding value. Make sure that it's successful. I get asked periodically to join boards of HR technology companies. And the first question I almost always ask is, what's the value to the customer of this idea? What's the value to the user of this idea? And will it add value to them? Second, what's unique that you offer that is grounded in theory and research? It's not, we have something nobody's ever done before. No, that's not going to work. You got to build on what's been done and add incrementally or disruptively to that which is there. So those are some tips I would give you. Um, coming back to the succession planning that you were talking about, uh, how do you think a founder should plan his succession, his or her succession planning, and what is the right time to do so? Uh, timing is always very personal because the timing could be. By the way, it's not probably going to be age because most of the founders are not going to hit my age when they start to think elsewhere. So it's, it's not age, it's not likely to be age related. Uh, the timing is going to likely be when I'm not using my skills as best I can, when I'm not learning, when the business needs what I don't have. And, and, and what's really interesting, most founders are very smart technically and they need someone to think them through, am I the right person to move this company forward? Or do I need to have somebody else come in and do that? How do you do it? The simple question, the, the, one of the biggest mistakes big companies make, and maybe smaller companies as well, is they look at succession about the person. She should replace me. He should replace me. That's the wrong place to start. The place you start is to say, look at the pathway I'm on in my industry. Look at my customers, my products, my services. Where do I think that pathway is going to go? Is it going to go global? Is it going to go domestic? Is it going to go from product to service? What's that pathway look like? 
could I get a few people with me? And if you have an advisory board, that's often the role of an advisory board or a few consultants to say, what do I think my industry or my niche is going to be like in three months, six months, 12 months, or 24 months? And again, I'd love to go out three to four years, but nobody probably knows. What's the pathway to success in the future? Then what set of skills are going to be required? Technical skills, social skills, functional skills. What's it going to take this company to win in that anticipated pathway? And then to say, now, which people, A, B, or C, seem to have that set of skills? And so you don't start by saying, uh, uh, Jasmine or Sally or Mohammed is my successor. You start by saying, what are the conditions of success? And then which individual might best meet that skill set? And also talking about uh, culture. So when a founder is trying to hire people, uh, on what basis should he actually assess them? Uh, what are the criteria that he, need, he or she needs to lay down to uh, include a person in his or her team? I was just on the, company, on the phone with a company that I won't name. And they're going through some major change. And this happens to be a larger company, but it could also be a small company. As they go through that disruption or transformation or revitalization, whatever buzzword you want, they begin to identify four dimensions that they want to be known for. Innovative. They're creating new products and services. Agile, they're quick. They respond fast. They move quickly to opportunities. Um, can't remember the third and sustain, oh, customer centric. They're partnering, they're aligning with customers and sustainability. That becomes, those four things become the dimensions of their culture. We wanna be known for innovation, sustainability, agility, and customer centricity. That's what their brand is and that's what their culture is. Now, if you were a small company and said, these are the things we wanna be known for, innovation, sustainability, customer centricity and uh, agility. Then you begin to say, what are the behaviors of people who demonstrate those cultural attributes? Innovation, they take risk. They think outside the box. They're willing to do something new. Agility, they change, they move. They don't get locked into a position. They see alternatives. Um, customer centric, they're always focused outside in. What's the benefit of this activity to a customer? Who benefits? What's the future? Who's the next customer? And sustainability. How are we social citizens and responsible to the world? And so you begin to get the behaviors associated with that outside identity. And then when you interview folks, there's clearly a set of technical skills. If somebody doesn't have the technical skill I need, they're not going to get hired. But you begin to query about, given a choice, would you rather do what's been done or something new? Innovation. How likely are you to lock into what you've done? Can you give me an example where you did something in a class you took, if you're a new student or in a company you worked for, where you tried to change something? Were you intellectually agile? Were you curious? Were you learning? Were you experimenting? What have you done in your personal life about caring for the planet, social citizenship, sustainability? When you meet with, if you were to meet with a customer, what would your first few questions be? And if the first three questions are, here's a product we love, wrong. Your first question should be, tell me what problems you, the customer, are trying to solve. And my job is to help you solve those problems. So you can begin to interview against that outside identity and the behaviors that go with that. The other hint on interviews is don't rely on one interview. Um, have multiple people look at those, for example, those four dimensions. So if I'm bringing somebody in who's 2% or 1% of my company, here's the dimensions we're gonna interview on. Again, back to this example from an earlier call today. Innovation, customer agility and sustainability. And say to four or five people, could each of you make sure you query about these things and then we'll come together and talk. So I have a question. So, um... Look at my fancy cup. <laughs> This fancy indeed. So uh, I'm just I'm just uh, putting a different perspective. Um, so let's say uh, I'm the first HR leader hired 
on a growing company, let's say after a couple of rounds of funding, um, let's say uh, if I am hired as the first HR leader, how can I uh, help the founding team or what, what would be the advice which you would give uh, for me as the first HR leader uh, in, a, in, a, in a growing company? I mean, what should I be focusing on? And how, uh, how can I play a crucial role in the growth stage of the company as a, as a first HR leader? And what sort of- Great question. Should Great I be question. looking uh, looking to build? What sort of uh, people should I be, uh, you know, arming the HR team with? And what should be our focus? What should be like the first couple of things which I, which I should be starting to build as the first HR leader? Super. I've got an A and a B. A, HR by definition has a series of policies and practices and administrative details. How do we go about hiring given the legal requirement of whatever country I live in? How do we go about uh, paying people? One of the things we're learning in HR, and, and I'm assuming uh, you see this wherever you live around the world, is a lot of that A, administrative work should be done through technology. And I know in some countries in the world, they have support systems by communities to do the administrative work of HR online. So I would probably go find an online service that I can contract with. I get tempted to name some, but I uh, work very hard not to be a promoter of any specific. <laughs> but as an HR leader, go ask some folks. What technology do you use to do the administrative work? Because if you don't, as a new HR leader, you can get sucked into doing all day administrative trivia. Get it online so, as much so. as humanly possible. Second, B, really focus on business. And so even in my interview with the founder and his or her associates, when they say, what should I expect from you from HR? I would likely say, if you're hiring someone to be the policy police or to do the administration of payroll and staffing, don't hire me. I'm going to mostly put that online. Here's what I bring to you. In my discussions with you, I will be your coach to work with you one-on-one -on -one and the facilitator of your team, of our team, to manage three things. Talent. I will help us make sure we have the right talent for the future. I'll help set criteria. I'll source people. I'll screen people. I'll bring people in. I'll create a work environment that gets people to give their best and find meaning everything related to the talent equation. Two, I will help you build the right culture. Culture is not just who you are as a founder. We appreciate you. But culture is what we're known for by the evolving customer marketplace. I will work with those in the marketplace to take that external identity, the firm I just talked about, innovation, agility, blah, 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 sustainability, and I will help us bring that in to all of our policies and practices. And third, I will help you and your team create great leadership because I believe a leader is the example to talent. Your people will do what you do. If you come in late, they'll come in late. If you come in early, they'll come in early. If you don't ask questions, they won't ask questions. I'm going to be your facilitator, your coach and leadership. Leader is not just about you, the founder. It's about your distributing leadership to the next generation. So let me come back. If I'm the new HR person, A, get the administrative work done as efficiently as possible, probably through some form of technology or digital. B, talent, leadership, and organization. Those are the three things I will help our organization create. And then C, I want equity. <laughs> I want a piece of the future growth so that I, because I am a player in your world. So I want a small piece so that is a, that was a joke, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think HR is central to that business success. So A, administrative, B, business. And what time is the right person to get um, an HR business partner? And what time is it right for a growing company to carve out a separate uh, HR functions? You know, it's really tricky. And I said earlier, the rule of thumb for me would probably be between 75 and 100 people because that's when the talent begins to coalesce into a company. You know, and, and somebody could say, well, I'm at 50 people. Good, do it. 
my, if I were coaching a founder, I would say to him or her, you're the, you're the head of HR. I mean, and, and it's not HR. You're the head of talent, leadership, and organization. This is your company. It should have your brand on it. It should have your identity. When you find yourself spending too much time on all that complexity and you want someone to challenge you to build the next generation, talent, leadership, and organization, go find the right HR person. That may be 30 people. It may be 50 people. But if you find yourself, because by the way, as the founder, you've also got to clearly worry about funding phase one, phase two, phase three, cloud sourcing. You've got to worry about customers and products and success. You've got to worry about your operating systems, your plants, your facilities, your technology. If you find yourself getting distracted by talent, leadership, and organization, that's probably the time to come in. We've generally found 75 to 100, but by the way, you could get a lot of variance on that. If you're at 250, Man, that feels too many. If you're at 15 or 20, that feels too few. So somewhere in that range. I, I have a follow up there. Uh, typically companies which are strongly rooted uh, around people and culture, you rightly mentioned at the beginning of this talk that uh, the thing that you should build your, build your culture foundation is to uh, uh, crystallize what your customers want, right? For example, there are good examples like Amazon, which is uh, uh, which builds around customer centricity, or maybe a Zappos, uh, etc. Um, so, uh, as a HR leader, uh, typically, uh, you know, when I meet a lot of other HR leaders, uh, one thing is how to be business centric, right? And how do you get a uh, how do you get invited to the business meeting? right, a uh, uh, chair on the table, right? Uh, and how do you really influence the whole, uh, you know, one of these uh, uh, famous examples where Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, uh, when he spun off a new company, uh, one of the first, in the first five or six people, uh, the person he hired was the HR person, right? Mm. Because- uh, I didn't know that, that's good. Uh, this, is, this is in his book called Behind the Cloud. Uh, so he believed that it's going to be core to uh, what they do as a business. And, uh, you know, HR is more strategic as you, as you pointed, less paperwork and more strategic work. But that's something which a lot of HR leaders, especially the first HR leaders who is hired, how can they earn a chair on the business meetings? How can they be part of the company's business strategy? And what do you think, or what would be your advice uh, for the HR leader of a growing company, or let's say a, a slightly grown up company on, on, on its path to, let's say, a scale up phase? Super question. Um, we've done a lot of research on this, and we've got data from 90,000 people over 30 years. And the term that we use, they call it HR business partner, commercial lead. Uh, we've called it strategic positioner, and we have found four things that that HR person needs to know in order to participate fully at the management level. One, they've got to know the language of business. Um, I think sometimes HR people come out of a sociology or psychology background, and they're afraid. What's our cost of capital? What's our net present value? What's our uh, EBITDA? And so my coaching and counsel to an HR person is go learn 20 words. It's not, it's not having to get a PhD in accounting or finance. Look at the business and see what language they use. And if you don't understand the language, net present value, sit down with someone and say, what is this? How is it calculated? How is it used? Language of the business is a table stake. I'm, um, I come out of a degree in English and a PhD in organization theory, and I've been able to learn business language. I'm not a chief financial officer, but I can have a discussion about the language of business. Number two, know how your company makes money. If there's a roadmap, we take in a hundred, whatever unit, euros, dollars, pounds, lira. Uh, there are no more lira. Euros, dollars, pounds. I just <laughs> dated myself. Um, drum. What do we do that makes money at the end of the day? What do we do that makes money? How do we make money in this business and know that money chain? Number three, know my stakeholders. 
Competitors, how do we differentiate? Customers, what do they want? Suppliers, how do we network with them? Investors, how do we serve them? Government agencies and regulation. Number, language of business, how do we make money? Know my stakeholders so I can engage in a business dialogue. And number four is a little broader. Know the evolving context of my industry. What's going to happen in my industry with technology? Work 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, whatever point you want is changing. What's going to happen with technology, with demographics, with people? How do I get ahead of some of that? Can I see the context? So those are the four very concrete things we say to the HR person. So that when you go to that business discussion, and by the way, I argue, in fact, I just got into a major argument with someone on LinkedIn in the last 48 hours who said, HR should be commercial. That's the future of HR. And my comment was, that's the 1990s. We had that debate. Get to the table. Frankly, I'm going to be fairly aggressive here. If you in HR don't know how to get to the table, get out. Because the opportunities are so real. With CEOs like Salesforce, and I have not read the book, and the U.S., the Business Roundtable just published a document last fall, Profits and People. They know that talent, leadership, and organization are central. They want HR at the table. And if you're not able to get there, there's something deeper going on. I, I've said to folks, if you can't get to the table today in HR, go work in finance. And that's a joke. But, um, <laughs> but those are the four levers. Knowing the language of business, how we make money, stakeholders, and context. If I'm also the HR leader who's uh, building my function, uh, as the team grows, and we have had our own learning, uh, we grew very rapidly from uh, 300, 350 member company to a 3,000 member company roughly now. Wow. Um, so if I'm the HR leader, um, how, what are the different uh, stages through which uh, uh, the company is going to evolve, right? Uh, from like, say, when it's like a 200, 300 member company and uh, one of the things which we read uh, is, is the importance of a HRBP, right? Uh, a business partner. And from, from this stage of it being like a 200, 300 member company all the way to like a 1,000 or 2,000 member company, what role does a HR business partner play? And as a leader, when do you think will be the right time for me to bring in HR business partners? Uh, is it when the business gets complex or is it when a department gets more complex or is it, is it when I have, let's say, department level success metrics, which I have to track. So what, when, when do you think, or how, as a HR leader, how should I be thinking of this whole role called a HR business partner and, and what makes sense and when should I be bringing, bringing like a specialist like that person? And because you've written a whole book about this. So I, I just wanted to hear. So I'm curious. I, I'll share my views, but I'd love to hear your views. You've been through this. So you went from 300 to 3,000, hopefully to 30,000. What have yeah. you learned? What have you learned? And Vidya, you could also comment, but let's hear first from Santil. So uh, what, what have you learned? As we expanded, uh, we became... Uh, like this whole Freshworks into Freshworks engineering and Freshworks sales department and Freshworks, uh, you know, uh, uh, support, customer support department and so on. So the need for each of the organizations on what determined people's success was different, right? Um, so that was when we sort of thought that it might be a, uh, and the, 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 the leaders will become more and more independent and what, the, as I told, as the, as the business became uh, more complex in terms of multiple countries, right? We started with one country. Now we have presence over more than 10 countries, right? So when it, when it spanned across multiple countries and when the needs for uh, each of the department became uh, more specialized and specific, um, so that's something which we felt that, hey, I think, uh, and, and for, for like a single HR leader to have uh, insights into each one of this, and uh, for a single HR leader to partner with the respective leaders uh, to help 
do the, the three things which you talked about. One is coaching and planning for the specialized talent which that particular department needs. And uh, third is basically leadership, right, of that particular department. This is this is sort of uh, the three uh, inflection points which we saw when we saw that hey, uh, maybe we need like individual attention and and and, and greater specialization for us because uh, for each of these departments to you know uh, serve their respective business goals. I don't know if I answered. Uh, no, I. Uh... Vidya, would you want to add anything to that or let me respond? Actually, I, you can respond because I'm recently fa uh, fairly new to this organization. So okay. I've not seen the transition. You know, the, thank you. Sinhil, you were absolutely perfect. I'm glad this is on videotape because people should watch you, not me. <laughs> Here's what I heard you say in terms of a principle that can be adapted. HR should follow the business logic. And you said, we have fresh A, B, C businesses. We have multiple countries. Each time one of those businesses goes after a different market opportunity or those countries move into a different space, as you get a business leader in that unique organization unit, he wants really two things. He wants somebody who helps him or her with finance, with money, three things, money, HR, and people, and a customer. And so when he or she puts together a team, HR should be part of that team. And so my sense is HR should follow the business leader. When that leader creates a team that's distinct for those three businesses, HR should be on the team. Um, that's a new company and an old company. Um, they're in the United States today, and I think around the world, there's a lot of private equity. The number of publicly traded companies is down about 50% the last 10 years. A lot of those private equity companies used to be successful by, uh, by simply cutting costs. So they'd go in like remodeling a house. You'd paint, you'd carpet, and you'd resell. That's no longer true. And so those companies now are reinventing themselves. There's a legacy CEO who's known around the world named Jack Welch. He was at General Electric, very successful. He is now an advisor to a private equity group. When he goes into one of those private equity companies, he, has to, he, he, he says, I'm gonna meet with the business leader of private equity, and I want in the room the head of finance and the head of HR. Because when I look at reinventing these companies, it's not re-carpet and paint, it's transforming that house or that entity. I need to have great fin financial discipline. You gotta make money. There's no, there, there's no shame in success. And I've got to have the right, you had three, you had coaching, which I put with leadership, talent, and I would add culture. You've got to build talent, leadership, and culture in that organization. And the head of HR should be the architect, not the owner. The owner is the business leader. You are accountable for that. But the architect who gives counsel, I want HR in the room. It was really interesting as I talked to the folks involved with Jack Welch in this effort, they had 30 companies in their ecosystem of private equity. Many of those ecosystems didn't have HR people who could handle his pressure to really deliver those results. They had to change out their HR people. And I would argue that I didn't attend Sherm last year. I enjoy Sherm. I appreciate Sherm. They're a great player in the field. I hope we don't talk much more about HR getting to the table. I think we've had that discussion. We know that we gotta be at the table. Business leaders know that. What do we do when we're there? What do we say? That's How do we win? And, and getting access is not the issue. Delivering value is the issue. And that's where I hope we go. So, and that's what you said. I mean, if I reflect back your comments, our business grew by this business, this business, this business, then we grew by country. Then we had some functional areas. Well, when there becomes a business leader in each of those businesses, geographies, or functions, she or he should surround themselves with finance people, HR people. I'd add another one, technology and digital people, because I think digital changes the world so quickly. But do you think the debate is still on about if the HR should be at the table or is the debate over now? 
Can we say that it's over? I, uh, I had a long discussion on internet with somebody this week and she said, <laughs> that's the future of HR. And I said, no, that's the past. Let's move on. Yeah. I think good HR people should. Now, to be really fair, there's always a percent of business leaders who don't understand HR. They don't see the value in it. You know what? I think that's reducing. I think that's reducing. Um, and in those cases, I say to HR, don't talk about HR. Talk about talent, leadership, organization that helps us win in the marketplace. One of the fun tests I give, and I'd ask your listeners to do this, what's the most important thing that HR can give your company? It's a very interesting test. What's the most important thing HR can give your company? And the answers I almost always get back are an employee experience, uh, clear compensation, hiring people. My answer is that that's all great and wrong. The most important thing HR can give your company is an organization that wins in the marketplace. Let me say that again. The most important thing HR can give your company is a company that wins in the marketplace. Because unless and until we win in the marketplace, there is no workplace. And so I filter almost everything I do through that are you helping build the right talent, the right culture, the right leadership that helps us win in the marketplace, the financial marketplace to access capital, the customer marketplace to deliver value to customers. And that mindset really begins to infuse itself as HR becomes a player in the business game. I think it's, it's you, you, you just are putting it in a most beautiful and, uh, uh, you know, uh, concise form. I think you, you, uh, sort of also represented so many HR leaders you've met. Uh, and it, I, I can see all the combined knowledge coming together here. And I have a uh, follow up uh, on that, Dave. So you mentioned that uh, one, of the, one of the ways by which HR can contribute, not just be in the room, but contribute, uh, you know, is to answer this question on uh, how can I, uh, how can I, as a HR leader, contribute for the company to be winning in the marketplace, right? Nice. Um, so outside of understanding business, outside of uh, how will I help the business get the right talent, what are the other skills you think great. as a HR leader I should be? See, one one thing which which seems obvious from what you just mentioned some time back is do less paperwork, first just take that off, make technology do that, right? But outside of being, uh, being business savvy and uh, uh, building like a talent strategy that, that's, that's, uh, that goes hand in hand uh, with your business, what are the other, other skills as a HR leader, as the first HR leader or uh, as the HR leader of a young company, uh, how can I, uh, set the company up uh, for a long-term success and what are the skills which I should acquire outside of these two? You know, I'm going to give you a bit of a complex answer. So I hope you're, those who are still listening will get it. I'm going to create a matrix for you. Three columns, talent, leadership, and organization. That's what we give people. Four things that we can do to make it happen. So how do I get talent, leadership, and organization to happen? One, and you said it brilliantly, is coach. Work one-on-one -on -one with business leaders. Um, and I could talk more about coaching. Marshall Goldsmith and others have been my mentors and models, but help people get the right behaviors, the right outcomes. Help people one-on-one -on -one know how to deliver talent, be an example. Anyway, number two is facilitate. Facilitate and the processes. Are we involving the right people? Are we managing the processes of strategy, of compensate, uh, of, uh, of digital? So coach one-on-one, -on -one, facilitate the process. Number three, design good HR systems. Design solutions around talent, leaders, or talent, compensation, training, communication. Design those solutions. So you coach on talent, leadership, and organization, and you facilitate the processes, then you design solutions. And four, deliver, execute. Make sure those things happen and hold yourself accountable. So my three by four matrix, I will help you, the business leader, deliver talent, leadership, and organization, culture. 
through coaching you, facilitating processes, designing HR solutions across all the HR practice areas, and I will be accountable with you, the business leader, to deliver those. So I will make those happen. I'm not just going to give you an academic, um, wonderful PowerPoint. I'm going to make those happen. And my sense is that's what you did. I mean, it, it would be fun to have you look back and say, in those 12 cells, talent, leadership, organization, coach, facilitate, design, and, and deliver, where did I do my job? And I hope we in HR can do all 12 of those. Now, there are skills to do that, but I think I'm going to leave it at that. So you mean to say that HR leaders should also take a business goal? Oh, there is no HR goal. Uh, Dick Beatty, one of my other great mentors and colleagues, <laughs> says there is no HR scorecard. There okay. is only one scorecard, and it's the business scorecard. Business we scorecard. play on that scorecard. They don't play on our scorecard. I ask you about your uh, personal journey. What motivates you to do better and better? And what is that one piece of advice that you would give to like any working professional in the world? Um, my advice is I won't give you advice. Um, <laughs> I can tell you my passion, and everybody's got to find their own. Uh, I want to create ideas with impact. That's a term I've used for 30 years. Ideas. I want to learn. I want new stuff. I want to create the future. To this person online today who said HR should be commercial, I'm going, I got that. Been there, done that. Even if I were commenting to Sherm, I'd say, okay, we're at the table. What do you say? What's next? In fact, we're in the middle of that, and that's not this focus today, but we're designing our next study. What can HR do next? And what do I hope in three years Sherm will be talking about that we're not doing today? How do we get ahead of that? Ideas, fresh ideas, new ideas, learning. Uh, when I teach, I often use PowerPoints. And my personal rule of thumb, and it sounds easy and it's not, is 20 to 25% new PowerPoints every 18 to 24 months. Now you say, well, that's obvious. That's really hard. A lot of folks at my life stage and career stage, they've given the same talk so often, they don't even need to think about it. I want 20 to 25% new material every year and a half. Ugh. That's really hard. That means uninventing, relearning. When we look out next, we see some cool stuff on the horizon. Number two for me is ideas with impact. I want to make a difference. Um, most of us get in life lanes. I'm now obviously old. I'm in a life lane. The benefit of my life lane with uh, this family, that's not all of them. We have two more kids. Uh, this weekend, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's a privilege or not, as a grandfather, our kids live all over. They all came in for a family activity. And on Saturday, my sister and I babysat 10 grandkids, under 10, for five hours. By the way, that's harder than any HR talk I've ever given. <laughs> um, but I was processing that and I thought, huh, I'm going to get emotional. What's my agenda? My agenda is to help those grandchildren have a life better than mine. That's my agenda. I don't know how I do it. I don't do it directly. I do it with their parents. But that's what the impact I hope we can have in HR I believe so profoundly that talent, leadership, and organization, the HR outcomes, create organizations that give meaning and purpose to the employees, to the customers. And I believe organizations are the greatest source of good in our lives. Look at my office. I've got books. I've got pictures. I've got a computer. I've got a cup. I've got a shirt that's not probably the right shirt to be wearing. I'm sorry. I've got a headphone. This is done through internet. Every single thing you see in this video is brought to you by an organization. Without an organization, we wouldn't be having this call. There wouldn't be books. There wouldn't be portraits. We create movements. Martin Luther King, Sheikh Zayed, two of my iconic examples. They created institutions that created better lives for people. So I love ideas, value, freshness, new, that have impact, that create value for others. And I'm passionate about that. And, and I still have energy to do that. That doesn't go away. Yeah, that's... That's, I think, amazing about you. You, you, you. you sound so young. I mean, you are full of life and you're so energetic. I really admire that about you. I'm not young. I'm not young. But <laughs> I'm, I hope I'm young with ideas. I hope, I, I call them my idea friends. And it's a horrible metaphor. My wife gets annoyed with me because I say, 
my idea friends are some of my best friends. And she said, I thought I'm your best friend. And she is. But I love idea friends because the, the ideas become like a friend. They wake me up at night. They keep me company. I talk to my ideas. They talk back to me. We have debates. And those idea friends become a part of that idea for the future that then I hope creates value for someone else. Right. So I think uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, the ideas which you shared the last uh, five minutes, Dave, um, especially around um, how, as, as, as you mentioned, it's so hard to refresh your entire uh, uh, idea in like uh, 18 to 24 month period, right? Which means that you'll have to come up with something whole new right? That probably explains the 30 books which you've written, right? In the last. So how do you keep pace with something like that, right? How do you, uh, for example, if you can take us, uh, uh, how do you source these ideas uh, of, let's say, the last two or three books which you've written, right? Uh, is, are these studies which you do? Or how do you, uh, how do you decide what you're going to do? Or, you know, um, Next year. No, no. I, uh, one is I really listen carefully to problems people have that they don't have an answer to. Um, l uh, let me give it, and, and, and by the way, I have an experience and I visit companies that are thoughtful and creative, and then I try to listen. Let me give a quick two quick examples, and it's one that I think we're going to study in the next round. It's what I hope Sherm is talking about in three years. <laughs> I'm meeting with a woman who's a genius and, and, and one of the most talented human beings I've ever met. She's the president of a university with 40,000 students and thousands of faculty. The world we live in today, think of a pipeline, is incredibly complex. And universities around the world, wherever you are, you have students, faculty, uh, funders, governments, alumni, parents. It's incredibly complex and she's dealing, and it's gonna get more so with information ubiquity, with digital world. When I met with her, I said, so what's on your mind? And she said, we have a case study of some faculty who are upset. We have a case study of, of uh, and I don't wanna go into detail here, but we have a, uh, an alumni who is very annoyed at what we're doing, who's a big donor. And she said, Dave, I'm struggling in this world of incredible noise and complexity, where do I focus my scarce time? I have 100 units of energy, 70% are gone, meetings, commitments, I got 30%. If in my 30%, I try to respond to all of this complexity, I am gonna be good at nothing. How do I discern which of these events are significant signals that affect my business? And which ones are just noise? It's 15 minutes, it'll go away. Or it's a day and let it pass. I think that issue is really critical in today's world. And HR and business leaders who can separate significant signals from extensive noise are gonna be really successful. And so we're trying to unravel, how do you do that? What is just noise? It's going to pass. Let somebody else do it. It's not your primary agenda versus the signals that you better pay attention to. And when you pay attention to those, how do you need to respond? And the answer is quick, quick. I'll give an example again this weekend. I post on LinkedIn quite a bit. I hope people will follow me. When somebody comes out with an idea, let's say on Saturday, which was this week, and it's an idea I don't happen to agree with. If I wait until Wednesday, to respond, suddenly in the digital and information age, that idea has been transferred, 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 and suddenly one simple idea is out there and it's now the wisdom of a crowd. I'm finding I have to be one of the first or two commenters on the idea immediately because I think that idea comes from somebody who's really thoughtful and it's going gonna, it's gonna to escalate, 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 escalate. I got to respond quickly. So back to my friend who's the university president. You've got to have the capacity, if you think it's a significant signal, respond immediately. You can't wait three days today. You got to get ahead of it. So that's what I look for. Are ideas out there that intrigue me that I see business leaders struggling with and they don't have an easy answer. And 
That's what I'm looking at. And that's how I, uh, then I say, is that worth a book? That's a big idea. Is that worth a LinkedIn post or is that worth some research? And I do all three of those. Got it. I think that's, that's beautifully put. So I'd love if we had more time and I'm going to have to go here soon. I'd love to ask you, what's something you see out there that you go, wow, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Cause that's the kind of stuff, you know, she came and I said to the woman I'm coaching, don't come to me with problems you know how to solve. Solve them. That's the 70%. Come to me with stuff that's just hard. And I'm not going to give you a checklist. Do these six things. I'm going to say, let's co-create something. And let's see how it works. Anyway, that's what I try to do uh, to observe carefully. I think today, in, and I'll shut up with this one. In business, we're really enamored with analytics and statistics. My experience, and my PhD is in statistics 30 or 40 years ago. My experience is statistics measures what's been. Anthropology can identify what will be. And so anthropologists learn how to observe carefully and discern wisely what isn't measured yet. If it's already been measured, good, go do that. Be a business partner, get to the table. But when you're at the table, how do you help the business team distinguish between all this stuff going on what is just noise? Let it go. The Me Too movement in the United States, that wasn't noise. That was a significant signal because it's part of the societal values. It's going to have big. So what do I need to do? Boy, as an HR person, I better get out ahead of that and say, any leader in this company who's involved in an inappropriate way with gender in a sexual relationship or other kind of discriminatory way in this Me Too movement, you're going to get found out get out of it now and i'm going to get ahead of it before those issues become public because i think that's a signal not a noise it's not going to go away so i get ahead of that that's an example of where i think uh i hope that's the discussion at sherm in two to three years how do we get ahead of those issues not behind them okay uh, that's long story you ask thanks so much dave uh this was one of the very insightful time uh, which I got. Uh, I got a, a chance to learn different things uh, today and I really mean it, not for just the talk. And uh, yeah, Vidya, do you have uh, something to add? Yes, I am I'm highly inspired by your words. I do follow your uh, posts and articles and comments too on LinkedIn and I'm a big fan. <laughs> so I... Um, uh, there's one thing I would like to ask you, is LinkedIn the only place where our audience can reach out to you or? Uh, you know, I, I also live in a world of complexity yeah. and I don't have a, a bandwidth. And so LinkedIn is the place I've chosen. I'm posting every Tuesday tomorrow. I hope you'll look. It's, and for those who watch this, it may be yesterday or a week ago, but I'm posting, it's my 100th article. And right. so I'm summarizing what I've learned and how to use LinkedIn to help us move forward. So I hope you'll look at that. And uh, every Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. U.S. time, where I live, I post a new short post or a long article. Okay. And uh, I hope you'll follow those. Thank you Thanks for, for your time. I, uh, what a privilege. You know, one of the things I, uh, again, I spent, yes, Saturday <laughs> with 10 grandkids. Yes. And then at the end of the day, I was like this. Um, <laughs> you are not my grandchildren. <laughs> but you represent the next generation of HR. And here's my line, the best is yet ahead. I so hope that people like you and many of those listening, take what we've done and respect it, but move far beyond it. Because I'm hoping that my ch our children and our grandchildren will move far beyond what we've done as parents and grandparents. And that's what I hope for the next generation of HR. That's why I don't wanna go revisit old stuff. Right. Focus forward. Get ahead, keep it moving. And thank you for the two of you being iconic examples of doing that kind of work. Thank you.